Um, Dr. Lauren Silverman is our Stephen Camp lecture presenter today. Dr. Silverman is the director of the Division of Pediatric Endocrinology at Goya Children's Hospital in Jersey. He attended Columbia University as an undergrad and attended medical school at Rutgers Robert Wood Johnson Medical School. He completed residency at Long Island Jewish Medical Center, Snyder Children's Hospital, followed by a fellowship at CSF, where he was mentored by highly acclaimed and internationally recognized pediatric endocrinologists, including Dr. Mel Grumbach, Selma Kaplan and Felix Conti. Over the past 30 years, in addition to clinical practice, Dr. Silverman has been involved in resident and student education, as well as clinical research. His research pursuits have featured, um, have focused on clinical trials in the areas of growth and puberty. He monitor for the OPKO long acting Guatemalan trial. He has over 25 publications related to this pursuit. Additionally, he has served in various committees in both the PES and Endocrine Society. A product of the Jersey Shore, he routinely attends Camp Neheda, the New Jersey Camp for Children with Diabetes, and is proud to be a champion for diabetes in the annual Tour de Cure Bite, Bite Ride. Um, Dr. Silverman is our uh, Stephen Camp lecturer today. Dr. Stephen Camp was a board certified pediatric endocrinologist from Arkansas. He made a significant contribution to pediatric endocrinology in the area of growth, growth disorders, and medical ethics. He was a mentor to many students and pediatric endocrine fellows. Um, he was an active organizer of the STOLA. So we are honored to have Dr. Silverman present the Dr. Stephen Kemp lecture today, titled Longer Acting GNRH Agonists, Long-Term Outcomes. Thank you very much, Dr. Silverman. Thank you, Susan, for that kind introduction. And in, in New Jersey, we say Camp Najeda. I realize in Texas, you say Camp Najeda. Um, and, uh, you know, I, got, I had some ice on the trees this morning. And unfortunately, due to travel restrictions from work, which were lifted on Monday, uh, COVID said I couldn't travel. Um, but given the ice, I'm not sure I would have gotten there. I am going to try and, oh, I did something wrong already. Hold on. I'm going to try and share my screen. And please let me know uh, if we're OK. Or let me know if we're not OK. Um, so these are my disclosures. Um, so we I know the- not seeing your screen yet, sir. Excuse me? We are not seeing your screen yet. OK, hold on. Uh, but maybe when you went to share screen, you selected the wrong one. And so try exiting shared screen and going back to it. Okay, you see your desktop. There we, we have it now. There we go. And now we see it. Perfect. Okay, so um, that's me and our emblem. Those are my disclosures. Um, so I, I knew Steve a bit. Um, we actually um, were co-authors on a DNT publication um, uh, about growth hormone. And since I'm speaking about puberty, I figured I would try and figure out if he wrote anything on puberty. And this was a response to the Herman Gennon's article that appeared in Atlantis. And our previous speaker also wrote a, a response to that article. Uh, interestingly, uh, we can play pediatric endocrine geography but my son, who's a first year medical student, is a chef or has worked in restaurants significantly and has a master's in ethics. Uh, I can't say that I've composed any music, but I, I used to play. Um, so what is puberty? Puberty is a transition from an immature hypothalamic pituitary gonadal axis into an adult axis that's capable of reproduction. It's also a time of significant psychosocial change. And, and when is puberty? And this is a time cover from 2000. It's been updated. But in 400 BC, 
Aristotle felt that puberty occurred uh, when twice seven years old, in most cases, male begins to engender seed, and then at the same time in the female breasts swell. So what we're gonna talk about is, is early or precocious puberty. But I think, you know, as pediatricians first, um, and scientists second, we have to think of the big picture. So as endocrinologists, we know that puberty, you know, is a continuum from the mini puberty of the fetus and infant, uh, which is important when we evaluate kids for DSDs in the nursery, then the juvenile pause. And I like to teach that it's a reactivation of the hypothalamic pituitary gonadal axis. And having been trained by the folks at UCSF, um, it is gonadotropin dependent sexual precocity. And I think if we teach our residents and students and fellows to think that way, um, dependent versus independent, it really helps them approach a differential diagnosis. Obviously, um, this has morphed into central precocious puberty, but uh, if we use that term uh, on rounds, we would not be uh, well looked upon. Uh, and again, it's a reactivation of, uh, actually that's a mis type, I apologize, it's the HPG axis. And there is an endogenous pulsatility to the GnRH neurons, as you can see here. Um, this is, uh, you know, in a, in a model, and this is shown to occur in the Petri dish with the GT1 cell line. Uh, every, you know, 40 to 60 to 80 minutes, you know, we are seeing pulses that leads to LH and FSH uh, release from the pituitary and ultimately the downstream sex steroid effect. Um, and this is really a, a very important paper from the late 70s from Tony Plant's group in Pittsburgh, and I believe it's on the PES history timeline. And what he did was he placed a, a catheter into the lateral ventricle of a rhesus monkey, and he infused uh, LHRH at the time, a luteinizing releasing hormone or GNRH, in a pulsatile fashion, and he showed that he got pulses of LH and FSH. If he then gave it in a persistent fashion, then the uh, LH and FH pulse generation shut down, but if you gave it back in pulses, it would uh, resume. And that's actually the basis of our therapy. So long-acting GnRH agonists shut down the pituitary response to the GnRH pulse generator. Ultimately, clinically, we see a diminishing growth acceleration and advancement a reversal or a lack of progression of clinical signs of puberty. We can theoretically hold bone age advancement and we may increase the final height in these children if they're treated at an early enough age. And we know that biochemical puberty resumes when treatment is discontinued. So when we talk about the GnRH agonist, um, we need to look at the structure of, of native GnRH or native LHRH. So um, it's a decapeptal, right? So it's a 10 uh, amino acid protein. Um, the first three amino acids are important for activation uh, of the receptor. Um, then we have um, regulation of a receptor affinity at five and six, and six is circled. And then we have regulation of biologic activity at the end terminal end. And if we look at the relative potency of native GnRH all the way through decapeptol and other uh, agents that have been developed, we see that the potency uh, increases based on what the substitution is at amino acid six and what the N-terminal um, agent is. When we think about therapy for these kids, we need to think about what's, what makes sense. So it has to be obviously done in an outpatient mode of administration. It's got to work, but it also has to be reversible. So if you think about uh, perhaps the main group of uh, patients treated with GnRH agonists, men with prostate cancer, you're truly not worried about reversibility. Obviously, when you're talking about uh, fertility treatments and women with endometriosis, reversibility is quite important. And obviously it has to be safe. So these are the um, current medications available in the United States. And this is out of a publication that I'm an author on that it's uh, presence of, uh, it is presently in submission and revision. Um, so we've got the various uh, luprolides uh, under brand name Lupron, uh, one month, three month, 
We've got the trip to Rowland under brand name trip to door, which is a six month duration, uh, a subcutaneous luprolide brand name Fensavi, uh, and then the Supralin implant. And again, thinking about the potency, um, you know, hysterellin is actually the most potent uh, and luprolide is actually the least potent of what we have available. Uh, intranasal Cinerel and daily subcutaneous luprolide are still available. And having done this for a bit, um, you know, the first patients I took care of were taking, we, we called the medication they were on historically D-TRIP-6, which was luprolide. Um, so I've used all of these. And just so uh, people can understand the difference between the depots. So the classic uh, Lup Lupron depot or Tryptidor is actually a lipid nanosphere where the medication is both on the outside of the nanosphere as well as embedded within the nanosphere. Um, so it's released over time. Um, Fensalvi is actually a compound that polymerizes once it's been injected subcutaneously. And that's how you get the delayed release. And obviously we know that the uh, supralin is the histralin implant. So this is actually the first patient that was treated in Boston uh, by Bill Crowley. And uh, if you ask Bill um, what their approach was, they said, well, as soon as they saw that this medication was available for adults uh, and the fact that previous to having GnRH agonist available for therapy, all we actually had was progesterone treatment or, you know, medroxyprogesterone acetate, it was sort of a no brainer to give this a try. And as you can see, the first child treated was a two-year-old with uh, precocious puberty, um, gonadotropin-dependent sexual precocity. Uh, even I fall into the CPP trap. Uh, and this paper is from 1981. Um, and um, this is her pre-therapy uh, LH uh, uh, pulsing, LH and FSH pulsing um, at night and day. And this is her response to a, a, a luprolide stimulation test, native GnRH or factorial. And then on therapy for eight weeks, you can see that the pulsatility shut down and she had a flat uh, stimulation test. And then most importantly, off therapy, um, things resumed. And this was followed by um, the, the group at the NIH uh, in concert with the group in Boston, the group at UCSF doing longer term studies on uh, these young uh, young kids, mostly girls, uh, as it's a uh, female predominant. And again, we see that with daily luprolide, uh, this is just a represent, this is uh, five patients, uh, positive luprolide stimulation tests, flat stim tests on therapy, and then post-therapeutic uh, resumption. And this was the, the subsequent paper in the New England Journal also in 1981. This is the NIH group. Subsequently, and this actually came out, uh, was under study when I was a fellow, um, there was um, the development of the quote monthly, uh, which is 28 day uh, depot luprolide. Um, and actually this study um, uh, was, was 30 days uh, treatment. And what we see uh, in the solid lines is uh, the results of um, GnRH tests, so you have a markedly elevated LH and FSH. Um, but on treatment, um, after 30 days, the LH and FSH um, stayed flat. And this was uh, 1989. Um, and so again, the first of the longer acting uh, depots was shown to be efficacious in 89. And this had an N of five um, in that original study, and there were no treatment failures in that original therapeutic group. Uh, the next thing that came out historically was the histralin implant. And, uh, uh, you know, our group and I was very involved in the trial. And these are actually, um, uh, you know, all the various results of all the kids in the original trial, uh, both naive and non-naive. And they, we used the cutoff of a peak LH of four uh, at one month of age as a proof of efficacy. Uh, and for FDA approval. And you can see that all of the patients uh, did suppress and they maintained suppression through 12 months of age. Um, and there were no treatment failures in that group. Subsequently, um, the 12 week uh, Luprolide uh, Depot IM trial uh, was undertaken. 
Uh, Karen Klein uh, has been intimately involved in, in all of these injectable depot studies as well. Um, and in the original trial, there were two doses, 11.25 and 30. Um, you know, we talked about the middle dose, which was what was available uh, in the adult population, um, but the, uh, the agency and the uh, uh, pharmaceutical company and TAP at the time uh, decided these were the doses that they would want to use. Um, and you can see that you actually had a fairly good suppression of, uh, of LH uh, in regards to peak stimulated LH. Um, basal LHs uh, were occasionally elevated. And Dr. Thornton, who I assume is in the audience, when I went back and looked at the original report from Dr. Crowley, um, they specifically noted that a basal LH is not something to judge a lack of suppression by. And Paul will know that we published that data from the Histralin study. Erica Oyster published the same data. So when you are looking at efficacy of treatment, you can't say that a basal LH of two or three means you're not suppressed. Um, however, um, there were um, treatment failures in this group, um, nine treatment failures in the low dose, two treatment failures in the high dose. They were naive patients, but more importantly, no non-naive patients escaped suppression. And um, I believe most, I can't say all of us, and certainly our group, when we do treat with the, uh, the, the 12 week, which is 84 days, Lupron, we're using the 30 milligram dose. Um, the triptorelin uh, pivotal trial. So again, this is um, the um, six month or 24 week uh, injectable uh, triptorelin. Um, did show 95% suppressed at one month, 93 maintained suppression at six months. Um, so three of the total 44 patients did not maintain suppression of LH. Um, two of those, however, were males. And we do know that um, boys with gonadotropin-dependent precocity are occasionally a different group. We also know that the very young patients can be a different group and certainly patients with underlying anatomic issues, specifically um, hamartomas, may also be more difficult to suppress. And finally, um, the, uh, the newest player on the block, which is the, the subcutaneous uh, tryptorelin or the Fensalvi, and that was published, uh, I guess, two years ago at this point. Um, and again, Karen Klein was one of the leads on the, on the study. Um, there were nine patients who didn't suppress uh, LH at 12 weeks, eight who didn't suppress at 24 weeks. But more importantly, uh, and those are peak LHs, more importantly, only one didn't suppress estradiol at 12 weeks and two did not suppress at 24 weeks. And I think everybody is developing an experience with all of these longer acting um, in, implant uh, injectables, as well as the historical uh, experience with the 28-day the uh, Lupron and the implant. Uh, and I think we're all being uh, pushed by our formularies of what we can or cannot choose to use. Um, there are some practical issues about using them. Um, the triptider injection uh, needs to be given very quickly. Um, because of the mechanism of action, it can actually become much more difficult to inject uh, unless the injection is given promptly after mixing. Um, the Fensalvi uh, also needs to be mixed well, and the injection has to be given uh, deeply. You know, it, it's sub-Q, but it has to be all the way in. And then finally, um, we do know there are multiple case reports, including some from us, of broken um, suprelin implants that maintain suppression, and I just saw a case report of an implant that was in for five years that was still working. Uh, we had a patient who was in for three years. So again, there are, there are always um, the real world experience of using all of these medications. Um, and part of it is obviously because puberty is indeed the wonder years, um, both for uh, us as uh, parents and, and more importantly, as clinicians. Okay, so again, what happens when the medication is discontinued. Um, that's obviously quite important, you know, alluding to some of the things that uh, Sharon was talking about in the, in the last talk as well. So again, um, going back to the original presentation, uh, the original data from the NIH group, um, this graphic is strikingly the same as the one I showed you of what happened in the rhesus uh, monkeys. Right, so pre-therapy, you have an endogenous pulse generator, okay? 
on therapy, the endogenous pulse generator is shut down. Off therapy, the endogenous pulse generator um, is reactivated. And obviously that's extremely important. And you know, looking at the recovery of the axis, and I, and I like to teach the residents that literally the first paper that was written showed that it was work, that it worked. And the second paper, and this is 1988, uh, out of the NIH Boston Consortium, showed that when the medication um, was discontinued, things turned back on again. So again, this is your um, pre-therapy uh, peak, you know, LH and estradiol. Um, this is uh, at the end of therapy, so the last visit to the CRCs uh, when patients were on meds, estradiol was shut down, LH was shut down, uh, testosterone in the boys, and then by three months, you saw a uh, uh, normal peak uh, stimulated LH and certainly uh, out to 12 months of age, uh, 12 months post-treatment. Um, Kirk Neely, uh, uh, through it's amazing. There was a nurse at, uh, at Abbey, uh, Taft and Abbey, who somehow kept this uh, original uh, Lupron study going um, in the out years. Uh, and a lot of this data was published in the, in the 2010, 20 teens. Uh, I was asked to sign a 1572 about, I don't know, 15 years ago for my involvement in the study in 1990 as a fellow. There were no 1572s in 1990. Um, but we can see that when the kids, uh, when Lupron was discontinued by six months of age, their mean peak uh, LH was up to 21, similar to their pretreatment LH. And we'll get to some of the other recovery data uh, as we go on. Um, but again, um, this is sort of a, a real world experience um, in a larger group of patients. The, uh, the Japanese group looked at menarche uh, in girls who were treated with Lupron. Um, and uh, the solid line is the girls who had menarche um, before treatment. Um, and we see that 50% of those girls had their first, uh, their, their, their first uh, recurrent cycle after treatment at about 10 to 12 months um, after the treatment, treatment was discontinued. And the girls who, who uh, never had uh, menarche in the first place uh, that 50% was, was somewhere between 15 and 20 months. So somewhere in that, you know, one and a half year mark is when you would expect the girls to uh, resume their menses. If we look at um, the recovery of the axis and the kids treated with the Kistrelin implant, um, similarly, we see that, you know, this is, you know, the original group of patients in the study was, was 35. Um, and, you know, ultimately only two of them were treated for six years. Uh, but when we looked at all of the kids after, um, when they came back after the implant was removed, uh, and unfortunately only eight of those kids followed up in the study, um, you know, by six months, um, we see that they all had positive uh, you know, pubertal uh, stimulation tests. And similarly, um, we see that their estradiol levels were recovering as well. Thinking about uh, Menarche, uh, again, um, the group in Israel who was involved with the original um, Suprelin implant trial um, looked at the time to Menarche in kids who uh, got tryptorelin, uh, uh, which is what's treated, used to treat in Europe, uh, you know, even a number of years ago, versus the implant. And you can see that it took a longer time uh, to Menarche in the kids who had injectable versus the implant. But if you think about it, that probably makes a lot of sense because you have an injectable medication that needs to wear off over time. There's still some medication that's there. However, um, once the implant is completely removed, as I alluded to earlier, um, it's gone and the medication is gone. So it's literally just the half-life of the hysterellin. And again, hysterellin is a much more potent agonist, but it does not seem to be interfering with um, any of the recovery, even though it is more potent because it's reversible. Um, last year, a very important study was published from uh, the group in Europe. It's called the uh, PREFER study, and I would refer you to it. It's in uh, the journal of our society. It's in Hormone Research and Pediatrics, which you all should have free access to as members of the society. And I, I'd ask you to look at the, the solid bars. It's the full analysis set. But the question asked was, in those women who chose to uh, attempt to attain pregnancy, 
were they able to attain pregnancy within X amount of time, having been treated for um, sexual precocity uh, as, uh, as young girls? And the answer was that 90% of women were able to achieve pregnancy. And um, that's extremely important. You know, I was taught, I guess perhaps not correctly, that the natural infertility rate is closer to 20%. In this cohort uh, control uh, in the European countries that were used, um, they quoted a, uh, in a natural infertility rate of about 10%. And that's what was seen in this group of women. So there does not appear to be any difference in fertility outcomes in uh, women who were treated uh, for sexual precocity as children versus their um, peer matched population. Right. Other things that we are always concerned about is body composition. So what this is looking at uh, in a uh, in an outcome study is looking at the bone mineral density adjusted for chronologic age uh, at the top and bone age at the bottom after uh, treatment with GnRH uh, agonist. So please remember that these uh, kids have been exposed to sex hormones, therefore their bone mineral density is likely to be quite high uh, for chronologic age at the start of therapy. Um, it may or may not be appropriate for bone age. So we have to look even though there may be less accretion of bone mineral density over time, we have to look at the out years. And if we look at the out years, um, you know, at the discontinuation of therapy, um, the bone mineral density uh, in black uh, was at the mean. Uh, one year after the end of therapy, it was also at the mean. Um, two years post uh, therapy, it was, you know, minimally above the mean. And again, we're seeing an improvement uh, or a normalization, not even an improvement for um, a bone age ST score as opposed to a chronologic age ST score. But even so, these are all within one SD of the mean. So they all are quote unquote normal. Similarly, um, the question has always been asked about body composition. Well, when you think about what we're doing uh, in these kids is we're changing their growth dynamics, right? So these kids have had growth acceleration. They've had increased growth hormone production due to the synergy of sex hormones. And um, therefore um, the, the prepubital chubbiness that you know, we certainly see clinically all the time has disappeared. Um, and you may therefore say, well, when they start therapy, they're gaining body fat. Again, we have to think about how it's changing for bone age, how it's changing for pubertal status, not just how it's changing for chronologic age. Um, so I just ask you to look at the, the black and the white. So the black is the lean body mass and the white is the BMI. We'll get to the height later, I promise. Um, so at the start of therapy, um, their lean body mass is relatively high for chronologic age. Again, this is not for bone age. And at the discontinuation of therapy, their lean body mass may drop a little bit and there's a, a trend towards an increase in BMI, but it's not statistically significant. When we go out uh, at one year and then two years after um, stopping therapy, their lean body mass is normalizing. In fact, it, you can say that it's dropping um, and their BMI um, is also um, tending to um, you know, normalize and drop from the suggestion of an elevated BMI that we, we saw at one month of therapy. Uh, I'm sorry, at the end of therapy. So what about height? Um, so, you know, this has always been one of the reasons that we are treating kids with uh, early puberty. You know, uh, in my mind as a pediatrician, um, you know, the psychosocial aspects are uh, more important than the height aspects. Um, however, the real world of who walks into the office, um, you know, even the 11 and 12 year olds are asking about the fact that their in puberty isn't going to affect their height. Can't we play with their, um, their puberty to quote, improve unquote their height. Um, so we see, obviously, as we're all aware, and again, this is from the original cohort in the late eighties from NIH in Boston, that um, pre-therapy, um, these kids had, you know, advanced bone age to chronologic age. Therefore, their predicted height was low. Uh, obviously, they had an elevated uh, growth rate. They had a high growth velocity. 
Um, subsequently, at the end of therapy, as we would expect, their growth velocity dropped. Their predicted height increased because we were able to uh, change the delta bone age over delta chronologic age, right? If that's going to less than one, you're, quote, improving, unquote, height projection. Um, you know, I don't predict height, I project height, okay? Um, that appeared to hold um, at three months out with a predicted height, and it held at 12 months out. Uh, again, where do the predicted heights wind up um, versus, you know, in, in regards to your final adult height? So this is the outcome of, uh, of that TAP trial. Again, uh, Peter Lee and Kirk Neely and Katie, whose last name I don't remember, who was the nurse at, uh, at TAP, you know, kept this going forever. So um, this group uh, had a target height of 164 centimeters at the initiation of treatment. And you can see the end is 29. Um, and at the uh, baseline of treatment, their, their height prediction was 157. At the end of treatment, uh, 18 of them had a um, predicted height of 166, so it surpassed their target height. Um, and the final adult height uh, that was reported, it was not measured, um, actually matched their target height. So again, this is an original group of 50 patients, 49 patients, their mean age was seven, their bone age advancement was three years, they were tall, but they did actually get to their target height range. If you get within minus 0.6 SDs of your parents' heights, you're doing great. And again, this is another way of looking at it. Um, their height SD score was plus 1.8 at the beginning of treatment, 0.8 at the end of treatment, and got to minus 0 0.6, uh, 0.06, excuse me, um, at adult final heights. So one would say that for this group of kids with a mean age of seven, and a bone age advanced three years that we did uh, positively affect their final adult height. Standing height, I, that deference to Alan Robel, all right? Um, similarly, uh, looking at the kids with the um, Hysterel and long-term follow-up, and they were only, they were followed out to five years, but unfortunately there was a relatively small number of kids who got uh, out to that time uh, in treatment but we can see that their bone age over chronologic age decreased uh, over time. Here's the ratio. And their predicted adult height increased over time. Unfortunately, we were unable to get all the, keep this study going to collect their final adult heights. But certainly uh, in this, again, well um, enrolled, not well enrolled, well-defined group of kids who met classic criteria uh, meeting uh, pubertal changes before the age of eight, a bone age, uh, girls before the age of eight, a bone age advanced by at least one year, we absolutely increased their predicted heights through therapy from a mean predicted height of just over 150 centimeters to one closer to 165. So when I was a fellow, went back and uh, Dave Paul, who is in Texas, I'm not sure if he's at the meeting. Hi, Dave, if you are. Um, went and looked at the patients who were treated uh, by the UCSF group and compared them to the historically treated girls who were treated with medroxyprogesterone acetate, who were treated with Provera. And the conclusion that the UCSF group came to was that we definitely improved the height of kids who are treated at less than six years of age. It's not clear that we improved the height of kids who are treated at over six years of age. Um, that has not persisted in all studies, but this uh, data here, again, is suggesting that in treated kids versus untreated kids, if you're treating at a young age, you're improving their height outcome. If you're treating at an older uh, age, you may not. And again, if you sort of look at this scattergram of the age of enrollment and the kids' heights, there certainly is a trend to a uh, taller adult height outcome in the kids who are treated at a younger age. And obviously the duration of treatment uh, also affects your height outcome, but I, and again, this is the Fran French data, which didn't suggest it. So this is Carell's data, and this is the NIH data. But I think the problem with that is that the duration of treatment 
is a surrogate for your age at presentation and likely how advanced your bone age is. So this certainly follows, right? If you've got a four-year-old with a bone age of 10, you know, um, obviously um, she's gonna be treated for a really long time as opposed to a seven-year-old with a bone age of nine, who you may only treat for a year or two, get it so that you know she can be in fifth grade or sixth when she has her first cycle. Um, and then this um, is a study that I found recently that's about two years old, looking specifically at boys with um, uh, gonadotropin dependent sexual precocity. And uh, again, in black is their predicted adult tall height. In white is their target height. And then the hash mark here is their final uh, adult height. So these are 20 kids who were treated over time. And we can see they started with a height uh, prediction of 170, um, slightly less uh, uh, than their uh, mid-parental target height. Uh, at the end of treatment, their predicted height was 174, again, greater than their target height. And their final adult height um, did reach um, their, their mid-parental target height. So that certainly is a, a positive outcome. And um, there's a meta-analysis that was published last year. And again, I would just sort of uh, have you look over towards uh, the favoring. Uh, and we see that the mean difference uh, is um, uh, tending towards favoring treatment um, in regards to improving adult height. Silver, I'm so sorry. Um, if you can wrap up. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm there. Okay. We're running out of time. All right. Thank you. So I gave you the past, I've given you the present, and what about the future? Um, so this is just a question. So it's not an off label use. We are using GNRH agonists, they downregulate the receptor. Um, there is a pituitary desensitization after initial flare up, and there is slow reversibility. The adult world is using GnRH antagonists. They block the receptor without receptor activation. They competitively inhibit. Um, they're immediate and they're rapidly reversible. So my first talk in medical school in 1983 by the dean was about a, was about AIDS. HIV had not been discovered or described yet. This is your syphilis. This is how you are going to learn medicine. I'm sitting in my basement 700 yards from the first containment zone in New York of the first uh, COVID outbreak. There is no evidence that COVID vaccine affects puberty. However, we have all seen deferred care and we have all seen the uh, explosion of obesity. Um, so I think we are likely having an ascertainment bias and seeing some kids with um, a bit uh, late picked up or some rapid progression in puberty because of the weight pushing it. 